Well, again, I want to get back to our You Asked For It series, and one of the top requests every single year has to do with our soul, has to do with either depression or anxiety or stress, one of those issues. And so today, I have the great privilege of talking on the subject of soul health again, and I want to go through a scripture that is one of the most popular scriptures in the Old Testament, Psalm chapter 23. I will read all of it at the end of my message today and show you how everything that I, I said came out of this chapter, but I do want to begin with just the first ver few verses. So if you're physically able, let's stand up for the reading of God's Word, Psalm chapter 23, verses 1 through 3a. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He restores my soul. We're going to talk about that today, how, what that means to have our soul restored and what is our soul. And in the New Testament, John has a prayer that reflects this sentiment. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. There's undoubtedly a connection between our health on the inside and our overall health. And if you're healthy in your soul, it tends to lead to health in your life. Let me pray for us today. Holy Spirit, I thank you for the Word of God. I thank you for the power of heaven. I thank you that you desire, as a great shepherd of our souls, to heal and to restore and to bring wholeness to us on the inside so that, God, that we can live the healthy lives that you have designed for us to live. We pray for your anointing in this room right now upon your word, upon your servant as I communicate it, and upon all of us to listen and to hear it with ears to hear by the Spirit of God. We ask this all in Jesus' name, and everybody shout it, amen. 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 You may be seated. I have a love-hate relationship with engine lights on my vehicle dashboard. I know they're there for a reason, but my engine dashboard seems to turn into a Christmas tree every few months, and so I have this kind of love-hate relationship. I know it's, t it's telling me something. It's letting me know you need to go to the doctor for your truck, and you need to list, have him look at it again and fix whatever situation it needs that needs to be fixed. Well, recently it came on. It's done this before. It says, tighten your gas cap, your fuel cap. And I thought, well, I just bought a new one and let's tighten it again. And then it came up again, tighten your fuel cap. And then after two notices, it just said, that's it, I'm turning the light on. And it turned the engine light on again and go back to the mechanic. And, and of course, the car just blew up. No, I'm just kidding, it didn't actually blow up. I'm kind of waiting for it to do that. But I, I, I say that because of this, we have an engine light. Yeah, so true. We have an engine light. And, and our engine light in our soul, when we begin to manifest stress, when we begin to manifest anxiety, when we begin to manifest depression, it's an engine light. It's an engine light going off saying, hey, your soul's not doing well. We need to go to the great shepherd of our soul, the mechanic who knows how we are fearfully and wonderfully made, and let's get things in the right order. Let's, let's figure out what your soul needs so we can get that engine light of your soul turned off. But what does the Bible mean when it uses the word soul? What does it mean? The, the soul in the Bible really is, it's who you are on the inside. You are a soul that lives in a body. And so my soul is my inner life. My soul is the inner part of me. The soul is who you really are. What we see on the outside, what you see in a mirror, that's not who you really are. We all gonna get a new body and how many of you are grateful for that someday, right? We're all like, especially the older people, we're like, man, I'm, I'm banking on a new one. In the, so in Psalm 23, it says that the Lord restores our soul. So he restores us on the inside, who we really are. To restore means to revive or to relieve. To revive, if, if, if my soul just feels dead, the, the shepherd of your soul wants to revive it. If your soul feels burdened, he wants to relieve it. And, and I'm just grateful that we serve a shepherd that knows all the intricacies of our inner life and knows exactly what 
we need. The big idea that I have for us today is this, that the health of my soul determines the health of my life. So the health of, of, of us on the inside determines the true health of our over, overall light, a life. Now, what are the indicators of an unhealthy soul? I mentioned stress or anxiety, living under that, or how about being cynical or angry on a regular basic basis, or maybe self-pity and no one understands me, or lacking balance in my life, or jealous when others succeed. There's all kinds of indicators of an unhealthy soul. Full of anxiety when your life isn't really full of any trouble at all. But you're just anxious because everything's going good and you know something bad's gonna happen again. I just know it. <laughs> or just extreme loneliness. Sure. Or it, you know, uh, lacking motivation for new challenges or lack of vision for your future. Maybe you haven't heard God in a long, long time. These are all indicators of an unhealthy soul. But what does a healthy soul look like? Well, a healthy soul, I, 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 I thought, I'm not sure there's a scripture that defines what a healthy soul is better than the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Galatians chapter five says this, the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Now, does this not look like a healthy soul? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. How many of you are like, I need some of that right there, right? Well, I got good news for you. The Holy Spirit wants to produce that in our life. So today I want to talk about five essentials for, a, for soul health. Five essentials for soul health. Now, essentials are that which is absolutely necessary. Your soul will need these five essentials in order for your soul to be at peak health. Some of you think the third job is absolutely essential. It's probably not. Others of you think Billy Bob down at the A, I ain't got nothing go going for me except for these biceps is absolutely essential. He's not. Your purity is. Come on, can I hear an amen, right? So there's a few things that are absolutely essential in our life. I want to talk about those today. My first thought is this, that, that your soul needs to connect to the purpose of God. Your soul actually needs it. For your soul to be at peak health, you can't live your purpose for life. You can't live for yourself. You can't just live whatever dream you have. You've got to connect to the purpose of God. Your soul longs for it. You were made by God and you were made for God. You were designed by God on purpose and you were designed by God for a purpose. We exist to know God. We exist to find freedom from all our issues and to discover purpose and to make a difference for the kingdom of God. I love, Colossians says this out of the message paraphrase, everything got started in him. Tell your neighbor, you're, you're a part of everything. You are a part of everything. Everything got started in him and what does it do? It finds its purpose in him. So, we were made to know God. We were made to help other people find him. And this is the ultimate purpose of our life. We, to be at peak health, our soul cannot live for ourself. Our soul has to live for the one who created us. And there will come a joy on the inside of you and a peace and an endurance and a patience on the inside of you when your soul discovers the purpose of God for which you are on the planet. And by the way, I know we all have unique gifts. And I know that we all have unique spiritual gifts and natural gifts. And some of you are administrative and some of you are really mission-minded and some of you are, are really hospitable and some of you aren't. <laughs> um, and that's why we didn't put you at the front doors. <laughs> That's why they don't let me, I guess. I don't know. But we're all made different. But all of us have one ultimate purpose. And that is we are all designed to help people who are far from God find Jesus. That's it. That's for all our purpose. Whether you're a teacher or a plumber or an engineer or a stay-home mom or stay-home dad or homeschooler or whatever, a student or college, whatever you're going to school for, whatever your degree is, whatever your job is, whatever you spend a lot of your time doing, ultimately all of us are on the planet to help people find Jesus. And so we were designed, our soul is designed to run the God race. 
Our soul is designed to run the race of Jesus Christ. And when our soul gets connected to that, our souls come alive. Hebrews 12 says this, let us run with perseverance the race marked out, look at this, for us. You see, there's a race that all of us are in. And if you're running the wrong race, your soul will just be exhausted. If you're running the race just to get a bigger house and to get a bigger bank account and just one dollar isn't enough and I gotta make another one, if you're, if you're only running it for yourself, you'll get exhausted. But if you run the race that's set out for you and it might be making more money, it might be becoming a billionaire and you're supposed to go to this church and tithe, I promise you that. But no joking aside, you, you honestly, some of you are designed that way to make money for the kingdom of God, not just for yourself. God created us to accomplish stuff. And I read a story recently about a guy by the name of Cliff Young who signed up for the most rugged ultra marathon in the world. It is in Australia. I think it's something like 547 miles long. It takes multiple days for people to run it. And this guy showed up. He, is a, he was in 1983. Cliff Young showed up with 150 other racers who were all like sculpted bodies and 20s and 30s. He was a 61-year-old toothless farmer. <laughs> showed up in overalls and rain boots. And walked up to sign up for the race. And they thought, oh, you're here just to watch. And he said, no, I want a number. I'm, I want to be in the race. People began to laugh. And people began to make jokes. He got his number. I think it was number 64. And the race then begins. And people's laughter even got more. As all the sculpted 150 racers just took off in the race. And they began to just go way ahead of him. Well, the old farmer, 61-year-old sheep herder, when he was asked actually before the race, what do you think you're doing? He said, well, he said, on our farm, we didn't have four-wheelers and we didn't have horses, but we had 2,000 sheep and we had 2,000 acres. And I had to round them up on my own. And sometimes it would take me two or three days to round them up, but I would for sure get them all and get them back. Well, he takes off on the race and he shuffles along. And he's just kind of shuffling and they thought it was just kind of a, he didn't even look like a runner and he's just shuffling along. Well, everyone knew that in the ultra marathon, you had to run about 17 or 18 hours and then sleep for six or seven. And then you would get up and you would run another 17 or 18 hours and then sleep for six. And you would do that for five days straight. So they all find their camp where they are after running 18 hours. And in the middle of the night or somewhere towards the early mornings, here comes Cliff Young just coming along through the race and right on through and right on by. And they recognize what is going on. Next night, same thing. Next night, same thing. Cliff just never stopped to sleep for five days straight because he told them at the beginning, he said, listen, when he told them that I would wrangle sheep for two or three days, they assumed that you would sleep at night. He didn't sleep at night for three days straight. He thought, you know what? It's just another couple days I should be able to do it. Guess what, my friends? Cliff Young, the 61-year-old toothless sheep herder, won the ultra marathon, not by an hour, but by almost 10 hours, beat everybody else. And after he crossed the finish line and they write him a check for the prize money, he didn't even know there was prize money. He said, in fact, he felt guilty. And he said, there's no, no, that's not right that I should win all the prize money. We all worked the same. And he divided up all the money amongst all the contestants and gave it all away. He then went on and kept doing that 
throughout the next several years of his life and gave all the money away. I came here to tell somebody, you may feel like there's not much purpose on your life and you may feel like everyone else is sculpted and can run and it's got this great purpose and you may feel like you're just a shuffler along the way, but I'm here to tell you, you're made exactly the way God designed you and you have a race to run. You don't have to run it like somebody else. You don't have to look like somebody else. But give God all the glory because I, I'm here to tell you, Jesus ran the race, he won the prize, and he shared the spoils with all of us so that we could finish the race marked out for you. I got good news for you today. Whether you shuffle, whether you look the part or not, God has a purpose on your life and your soul needs to be connected to the purpose of God. You know, Proverbs says something about laziness. It said, the soul of a lazy man desires, the soul of a lazy man desires and has nothing. But the soul of the diligent shall be made rich. You see, your soul needs to accomplish stuff. Your soul needs to accomplish things for eternity. And when your soul begins to see the fruit of Jesus doing something through your life, your soul it begins to run at peak health. The engine light begins to come off in your soul because you're running the race marked out for you. Now, let me get really clear for all of us, whether you're online or you're in the room, everybody's purpose, somehow, whatever you do for a living, whatever you do in life, whatever your personality is, I think it's important for everybody to connect to the purpose of God in building the local church, whether that be financially or you spend a lot of your time praying for her or whether that be opening a door or parking a car or ministering to our children in the kids' church area. Whatever it is, well, however you're made or leading a life group or however God designed you, somehow you gotta find a way to connect your life to what Jesus is building. And when you do, my friends, your soul will come alive. Can I hear an amen to that? All right. That's number one essential that your soul needs to live at peak health. Another essential that your soul needs for peak health is to passionately worship God. Exalting God through worship will help keep your soul healthy. Your soul and my soul, the inside of us is thirsty for the presence of God. Our soul needs the manifest presence of the Lord. And as, as Jason said, when you, as we, as we started our service today after our first song and welcomed you and said, you might think that these people are passionately worshiping God. And they are because those who have been forgiven much love a lot. And so when you've been forgiven, you, you have no other response other than just to say, Jesus, thank you so much. And you may be here for the first time and you think, yeah, but what is all this? They're raising their hands like it's a touchdown. Well, let me just tell you what. Um, you can start off with cradle the baby. You can start here. You can just start off low. No one sees it. You know, or you can just do the, I got a question, one hand, and you can start here. You just start low. But I do want to tell you, Honestly, however, you know, even if you make it to the goalpost by the end of the service today, <laughs> that our soul needs the presence of God. Our soul needs, it, it longs to worship its creator. I thought about somebody who their soul magnified the Lord and I thought, this woman had a strong, healthy soul and it was the mother of Jesus. Look at this in Luke chapter one. It says, Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord. And this is after she's told that you're gonna give birth to the Son of God. She said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. Now, Mary, as you follow her life, you will see that, that she's a good mom, obviously, right? The Lord picked a good mom for the Lord. And, and so she, you see her hiding the prophetic words of the Lord over Jesus in her heart when he's dedicated as a baby. You see her concerned that Jesus isn't right near at 12 years old when he's hanging out in the temple and, and being about his father's business when they had come to Jerusalem and they were on their way back and they realized, where's Jesus? And she's concerned about his whereabouts there. You see Mary, when Jesus begins his ministry and Jesus is saying like, well, I, you know, it's not quite my time. And she goes, listen, they're out of wine. Make the, turn the water into wine, you know, do something miraculous. And so he does. And then you see Mary at a couple places that I don't think you could see Mary unless God had done something incredible in her soul. 
So here it is, the mother of Jesus is standing at a distance watching her son and watching her Lord be crucified. When Jesus' best friends had scattered, but Mary is there through it all. And then what does this mother do? Where do you see her again? You see her in Acts chapter one and chapter two. You see her in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit where they are waiting on God, they are worshiping the Lord and they are praying. And then she's filled with the Spirit of God and declaring praise. It said that other people heard in their native language them declaring the wonders of the Lord. So you find Mary at the beginning her soul magnifying God. You find her after the crucifixion and after the resurrection, her spirit and her soul magnifying the Lord. She is a healthy woman of God, living out the purpose of God. Why? Because her soul is magnifying and worshiping a risen Savior. I'm here to tell you, you need to passionately worship him. Every now and then you got to get your hands out of your pockets and you just got to say, God, I'm all yours. Your soul's thirsty for it. And our souls long to overcome the trials of life. Our souls need to passionately worship God. Our souls need the manifest presence of the Lord. So if our souls are going to be able to be healthy through all these trials, then we need to worship him with our whole hearts. That's number two. Number three is this. Oh, let me say this. You can worship or you can worry, but you can't do both at the same time. You can worship or you can worry, but you can't do both at the same time. All right, number three, what your soul needs in order to be at peak health is your soul needs to release forgiveness. Your soul has got to let go of all offense and just release that to God. You know, when Jesus taught us to pray, right in smack dab in the middle of the prayer, he, he, he taught us to pray like this, forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And his very next thought is this, and don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. Do you think there's any coincidence that us forgiving other people is connected to being rescued from the evil one and us being delivered from the attacks of the devil? I don't think it's a coincidence that those are connected, that we release forgiveness and we also shut the door of the opportunities for the devil to keep getting at us. All right, I know most of you have heard the saying that choosing to not forgive is like, is, 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 is like drinking poison and, and expecting the other person to die. <laughs> For the two of you who haven't heard it, you're welcome. Um, <laughs> but it is true that we have to make a choice that I'm gonna release forgiveness in order, not, not because you deserve it, not because you've even asked for it, but because I make a choice I'm going to live at peak health and I'm not going to let you steal more from me than you already have. Did you hear me today? Don't let anybody else steal more from you than they already have by allowing your soul to remain bitter, by allowing your soul to, re to hold on to unforgiveness. My favorite story about this, maybe my favorite story in the Bible is the story of Joseph. If it's in the first book of the Bible. If you haven't read it, please do me a favor and yourself a favor and read the story of Joseph in the book of Genesis. I, I'm about ready to get it again here this week. I'm, gonna, I'm going through my Bible reading a little bit ahead. And, and I'm about ready to hit that story this week. And I'm so excited to get into it because it's, once you start reading the story of Joseph, it's like a movie. And you're, I don't want to be done with my Bible reading today. If you don't know the story, let me just give it in an encapsulated form really quick for you. Joseph is, is one of 12 brothers and, and he is uh, the favorite of his, son, of his father. And his brothers are jealous of him because of the love his father has for him. And so one day they make a decision, let's kill him. And another brother you know, pipes in and says, let's don't kill him. Let's just throw him in this pit. And then he's thrown into a pit. And then he's sold into slavery into Egypt. And he begins to be a slave for a high official by the name of Potiphar. Well, Potiphar's wife, Potiphar, she's after <laughs> Joseph. 
And so he's serving in, in Hotifer's house and she's like saying, sleep with me, sleep with me, sleep with me. And he's like, how, how dare I? No, I'm not gonna do that. I won't, not against God or your husband. I'm not gonna do that. And he keeps, well, one day he's running out of the house and she grabbed a piece of his clothes and he's going and, and, and got it. And then she lied about him to her husband and said, listen, he tried to sleep with me and, and, and then he got all mad and threw him into prison. So then Joseph's in prison. So Joseph has done nothing but just be a son and he gets jealous from his brothers, thrown into a pit, sold into slavery and then lied about when he was a slave and now he's in prison. And he spends several years in prison and he's serving the Lord in the prison. He's interpreting dreams. And then one day he has the opportunity to interpret a dream for the highest official in, in Egypt. And he interprets the dream correctly about a famine and then has the wisdom of God and how to, for people to survive the famine. And so he's placed from the prison to the palace overnight, takes a shower, shaves, and here you are, you're second in charge. And then in the season of time, after the abundance ends and then the famine hits, his family is in famine. They have to come to Egypt to get the resources that Joseph has been storing up. Now, for a lot of people, they would have years sitting in prison and then sitting in luxury thinking, how am I going to get back at my brothers? But not Joseph. Joseph didn't think about how he could get back at his brothers, even though many of us in our natural selves would say, I'm going to pay them back. Well, his brothers show up and he reveals himself to them and he weeps with them. And now they're a little bit scared and they're trying to say, like, what is he going to do to us? Because they recognize he has all the power. Look at what Joseph says. Joseph replied, don't be afraid of me. Am I God? that I can punish you? You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. No, don't be afraid. I will continue to take care of you and your children. So he reassured them by speaking kindly to them. Wow! What a story, what an amazing man of God. And I just say, we all need more of Jesus, right? Woo, I need more of Jesus. Martin Luther King Jr. said this, we must develop and maintain the capacity to forgive. He who is devoid of the power to forgive is devoid of the power to love. There is some good in the worst of us and some evil in the best of us. When we discover this, we are less prone to hate our enemies. So for our souls to be at peak health, we need to release forgiveness. And I think I, I heard from the Lord to say this to somebody. Some of you need to release forgiveness over yourself. Somebody needs to forgive themselves. And that is keeping your soul shriveled. God has forgiven you. Others have forgiven you. And even if they haven't, God has. And God says it's time for you to forgive yourself. I just felt that word for somebody here today. Two more thoughts for you today. And it's this for our souls to be at peak health is invest in uplifting relationships. Every soul, everyone's soul needs others to carry burdens with. Every need, everyone needs someone to share their concerns with. Everyone needs someone to process with. If you're the only one processing with yourself in your own head, your soul is hurting. That's why the Bible says it's not good for man to be alone. We need to share each other's burdens. That's why Galatians says it like this. Share each other's burdens. And in this way, obey the, the law of Christ. So we have to invest in the right people. Love the right people. Because the people you invest in and the people you allow to invest into you, they are influencing you. So we have the responsibility over what gets in our soul and who is allowed in our soul and who gets a place in our soul. So be wise in investing in uplifting God-honoring relationships. And last but not least, it's this thought, is your soul needs to wait on God. Now, this isn't a very popular thought in modern age of mankind, we just want to go and go and go. We want to take a pill so we don't have to sleep. Or we take a pill to sleep it off. But we don't want to wait. We don't know how to wait. And what I mean by wait is literally wait. 
be silent. And some of you, that's really hard. And the reason why is, is your soul doesn't know how to be quiet. Isaiah says this, those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. You see, your soul needs time to recoup. The inside of you is not meant to run 24-7. That's why Jesus gave us something called a Sabbath. That's why he gave us something called sleep every day. Our souls are not designed to run all the time. They need downtime. They need time to, to wait and to be silent. My wife and I were on, a, were on a tarmac this week in San Francisco waiting to, to embark on our way home. When we looked out the window and we saw Air Force One and we, we, we knew we're going to be here a while. <laughs> they ain't letting us get up. And that's exactly what happened. And so we got out and we were away from from the terminal and we were waiting and we could see out the emergency vehicles surrounding or whatever the vehicles they are surrounding Air Force One and then our pilot got on and, and, and said uh, we are waiting there's a, a VIP about ready to take off so we, we need to wait and you could see as then as, as Air Force One took off there was, there was a couple cars that were just racing alongside Air Force One, just trying to keep up with it. I thought that would be a fun job. <laughs> I want that job. How You can go as fast as you want. Just cruising right alongside until Air Force One was off. And then we were able to go. But there was, didn't matter who was on the plane. Did, didn't matter if there were doctors, lawyers, or other VIP in our plane or any of the other planes. But because Air Force One was about ready to take off, we all waited. And I just need you to know, I know you feel like you're pretty important and your life has got a lot going on. But there's only one person that's really truly worthy of our waiting. And that is, as we wait on him, he doesn't wait on us. And so when we wait, our souls begin to be strengthened and we mount up with wings like eagles and we run and we're not weary and we walk and we're not faint and we wonder how do I get all this without that? You don't. We claim it, we put it on our refrigerators, we memorize it, but we just lack this. When our souls require downtime, that, listen, let me define it because some of you don't know what that means. Off social media, phones away, all sources of information coming into you, gone, waiting. Let me show you what it looks like. Nothing else. And you say, well, what are you doing? Just waiting. What are you waiting for? God. He may just show up in my waiting. He may whisper in my waiting. You'll be amazed at how one whisper from God will sustain you for weeks. It's so true how the Bible says man doesn't live on bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. If you just wait and then all of a sudden just a scripture thought comes to you. God whispers, I'm with you. You need not worry. I'll never leave you. And you just hear that whisper and you go, God, talk to me. I'm supercharged. When you wait, you'll hear or you'll sense, and maybe not every time. Sometimes your soul just needs to be quiet. You know the Hebrew word for wait? It actually means to be intertwined. It's like a three-legged race. Y'all remember doing those at youth camps? 
It's like you, you tie up with your partner and you tie your legs together and then you have to get in sync with one another. That's what weight is in Hebrew. In Hebrew, you get in sync with God and he ties up with you. And you feel his leg move and you move with his leg. You feel when he pauses and you pause. You feel when he runs and you run. And it's those who intertwine, who wait, who tie their life up with God's. They renew their strength. Psalm 37 says, be still in the presence of the Lord. That's hard for charismatic type churches like ours, right? (sighs) Be still in the presence of the Lord. And wait patiently for him. And then don't worry. You see how those are connected? You're still and you wait and then you cannot worry. Our souls need to wait. Let me read all of Psalm 23 and and then I'll close in prayer. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. Wait on God. He renews my strength. He guides me along the right path. Connect to the purpose of God for your life, not just your own path. Bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I'll not be afraid for you're close. You're close beside me. That's passionate worship. I know of no other way to get genuinely in the presence of God other than worshiping him. You're close. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. Release forgiveness. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life and I'll live in the house of the Lord forever. Invest in uplifting relationships and build God's house. Our souls need all of these essentials in order to be at peak health. And the health of our soul determines the health of our life. Can I pray for us today? Let's pray together. Jesus, we worship you. Great shepherd of our soul. Thank you so very, very much for designing us the way that you did. You know exactly what our souls need. You know what our souls long for. And so today, whether, whatever one of these five thoughts is that you're talking to us about, I pray for every person in the sound of my voice today to hear your voice say, this is what I want you to focus on. I want you to connect your life to the purpose of God, or I want you to begin to worship me, or I want you to begin to wait silently, or I want you to begin to invest in the right relationships. Whatever it is, releasing forgiveness, I pray that every one of us will know this is what God's saying to me today. I'm going to take that next step so that my soul can be at peak health. And with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you are in this room and you are not sure, or online and you are not sure you know this great shepherd called Jesus, but you would like to know him, he is one prayer away. One sincere prayer that would say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. And if you'll forgive me and you'll come into my life, then I give my life to you today. If that's you and you say, Bob, I'm not sure I'm right or I'm pretty sure I'm not right with God, but I would love to start today at getting right with him. Then I'm gonna pray that prayer for you. I'm not gonna call you forward, but I would love to know Who's gonna pray that prayer with me between you, me, and Jesus? Will you just look up, catch eyes with me, and wave so I can see you and look you in the eye and know you're gonna pray this prayer with me today. I see you today. Who else is here today? I don't wanna miss you. That's wonderful. Thank you. Great. Wonderful. The Lord loves you so much. And if I missed you, he did not. But I want you to say yes to this prayer. Just whisper a yes as I pray this on your behalf. Jesus, I come on behalf of my friends today who say, I'm not sure I'm right with you, but I would love to become right. And I admit to you today that I'm a sinner. Will you forgive me of every sin that I've ever committed? 
or I ever will. I want you in my life. Become my Lord and become my Savior. I give my life to you today because you gave your life for me. I pray all of this in Jesus' name. And all the church shouted amen. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a thanks for how good he is today. He cares for us so much. We hope that today's message encouraged you. At Life Church, we believe that wherever you are in your relationship with God, there's always a next step to take, and we're here to help you find yours. If you made the decision to follow Jesus today, or you're simply looking to get more involved in this community, we invite you to check out our Next Steps page. You'll find all the information you need by clicking the link in the description below. If this message impacted you in any way, we encourage you to do two things. First, share this video with a friend. It's a wonderful way to share the love of Jesus with someone you care about. Second, we'd love to hear your story. Click the link in the description to share your testimony with us so we can celebrate all God is doing in your life. We're excited to be on this journey of following Jesus with you and hope you have a great week.